Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> hey, 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 don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila. Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to thenextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. It's hard to believe that we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. All that said, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. Becoming a Next Real member gives you access to all sorts of additional and exclusive content. Plus, you're helping us keep the lights on. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership, where you can learn more about becoming a member, which costs a measly $5 a month, practically the same as one fancy coffee drink. And you get so much more. Every month, we record a bonus episode exclusively for members. Those episodes cover movies from whatever series we're covering at the moment or add to previous series. Some movies we've covered that only members get to hear us discuss include The Blues Brothers, The Russia House, Naked Lunch, Independence Day, The Hot Rock, and Relic, the better one. Plus, members get to vote on what we're going to discuss for those episodes. We also record additional pre- and post-show content in regular episodes that only members get to hear. Like conversations about similarly themed movies. And answering listener questions from our live member chat. Speaking of our live member chat, we record almost all of our episodes in Discord, where members can chat right along with us live. Members get access to other members-only channels in our Discord community as well. On top of all that, members get all episodes a full week earlier than everyone else in a private Next Reel feed just for them that includes all the shows in the Next Reel family. The Next Reel, the film board, movies we like, sitting in the dark, and more new projects on the way. To top it all off, members don't have to listen to ads. We've already eliminated those annoying, dynamically inserted ads that, let's face it, we all hate it. We are listening to you. We love podcasting for a living, and those ads help to pay the bills. Now, we're counting on you, dear listener. We promise we aren't going back to those terrible, dynamically inserted ads that don't relate to us at all. All we ask is that you consider supporting the Next Real family of podcasts with a membership. Again, it's $5 per month or $55 per year. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership. Thenextreel.com slash membership. Get your access to early ad-free episodes with bonus content, member bonus episodes, and access to member channels and live streams in Discord by signing up today. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the next reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. We're gearing up for our next season to begin. Season 13, to be exact. 
That's right. And all season long, we'll be looking at past awards categories and discussing the nominated films. We're kicking off our new season with a series looking at the 1940 Academy Award Best Picture nominees. But back in season five, we discussed six of the 10 nominees. Because of that, we're releasing those episodes now so that you can get ready for this series. That's right. We're going to release those episodes from 2015 and 2016, in which we discuss Gone with the Wind, Goodbye Mr. Chips, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Ninochka, Stagecoach, and The Wizard of Oz. And to top it off, we'll be streamlining those older episodes a bit so they're just focusing on the films themselves. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Andy, I could find another wife easy. Yes, but not another horse. In our streamlined world today, adventures take wings. Planes scuttle across country at amazing speed. Man has raced around the earth in less than four days. Planes roar at 400 miles an hour. Airships, streamlined trains and buses speed thousands to new frontiers. Yet well within the span of our memory, the streamliner of its day, the American stagecoach, crossed the uncharted rugged west, bringing new people to a new country. What fascinating stories there were in the life of the stagecoach, and in the lives of its courageous passengers who found romance in danger and understanding in strange companionships. From the adventures of these American frontier characters, John Ford has created a truly great motion picture. Stagecoach, a drama as forceful and as true as the informer, and as gripping as the hurricane. Stagecoach, Andrew, 1939, directed by John Ford, uh, original story written by Edward Haycox, screenplay Dudley Nichols, starring, of course, John Wayne, Claire Trevor, Andy Devine, John Carradine, Thomas Mitchell, Louise Platt, George Bancroft, and Donald Meek. This is the second film of our second half of our 1939 series, the great, and I'm using now great in air quotes, films of 1939. How did this one hit you? I like it. I don't love it. I like it. Um, John Ford, I've mentioned in the last uh, several weeks, you know, he's not a favorite of mine. Um, I enjoy his films well enough, um, but I think I... I, you know, after watching this again, which I hadn't seen in a long time, I I think I find his films um, interesting to watch, but I don't get really, uh, you know, invested in them. I just kind of feel like I'm watching them from afar and, uh, and, and, and I enjoy what he's doing with them. But I, you know, his technique and stuff, I, I, I guess I prefer different styles of technique. I know he has a technique here. Um, there are some, some definite John Ford elements that I really like the way that he does certain things, but for the most part, I, I watch it and I go, okay, yeah, I like it well enough. I mean, I, there's, there's new stuff going on in this story that he's doing that I, I really respect that, um, what he's bringing to the table here. Um, but you know, just stepping back as, as a film itself, I like it. Okay. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. I watching this film really I think demonstrated for me just how numb my action western nerves must be, right? I am completely uh, enthusiastically ambivalent to this film on the whole. Uh the performances were fun. I think the ca- casting was terrific. I think you know what we now consider stereotypes in westerns were made more than their pot boiler kind of antecedents uh, just across the catalog. Uh, I think the stunts were great, uh, really audacious in the third act. I think uh, that it, it clearly set the stage for a leap in stunt performances, not just in Westerns, but action films as a whole. Uh, you hear the stunt community talk about what uh, what uh, Knut did in this film, and it just it, it's it's iconic. And And of course, this film made John Wayne a star. Uh, but still, we're watching this as part of this so-called great year of cinema history in 1939. And so far, there is one film that stands out as truly great in the entire list. And Stagecoach is not it. Uh, I think it was a good film. It scored so many individual points across the production and performance and even the politics 
Um, but uh, when taken on the whole, it's it really doesn't uh, bubble up more than just kind of mildly entertaining. I, I just couldn't I couldn't really get thrilled. It, I was never on the edge of my seat. No, I wasn't either. You know, I mean, I think I, I don't know when the uh, you know people started looking at 1939 as such a great year. I'd be curious to know, like, when that uh, moniker started for the year. Like, what was it about that year that people were looking back to and what specifically was drawing them to it? And I know, you know, is, is they say it's kind of like the last, uh, you know, the great year of of the films from the studios. And so, I mean, I guess that's part of it. But e- even then, like, this wasn't a studio film. This was kind of made outside of the studios. Um, it was, I believe, released through the studios, but I don't think it was it was made through the studios. It's I don't know. I'm curious. Um, what people were looking at. And I know Orson Welles, like, he saw this and felt, you know, this was like the perfect film school for him to go make Citizen Kane uh, two years later. The way that John Ford um, staged things, the way that he told the story, the way that he moved from scene to scene. Um, Orson Welles apparently screened this with his uh, cast and crew, like, 37 or 40 times before they got going making Citizen Kane to really kind of get schooled on the right way to make a movie. So clearly, at that particular point in time, there were elements to this film that really were critical in the development of of cinematic storytelling. Okay. That being said, I think today, I just, you know, it, it doesn't thrill me. It doesn't mean that that stuff's not there. It's just, you know, looking back at elements of of um filmmakers um putting things into films that uh, were new at the time that thrilled me more looking at something like the african queen i found more thrilling than this one yeah absolutely absolutely and i you know even though i you know the film i was thinking of is obviously um uh, uh mr smith goes to washington and you know that that's not even supposed to be you know thrilling you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and it was still edge of your seat dialogue. It was edge of your seat. But I mean, it's just it just didn't really hold up. And maybe it's because they were trying to do something that was really audacious. It was not a set piece. It was a we're going to shoot on location uh, and we're going to do so in you know, on a location that is so far outside the Hollywood physical plant that we're going to give ourselves some uh, b- potentially unintended challenges that we're going to have to overcome as a result. and. That that stands out. I mean, that's that is an accomplishment of of the film, and and that may be why I'm I'm feeling a little bit too hard. That's why I say that I think my my nerves must be a little bit numb uh, because it, it that I think is one of the things that makes it just not not hold up. Well, and I think we also have to remember, um, you know, trying to reset our mindset here. Yeah. At the time, you know, I mean, something like Mister Smith goes to Washington was in a world of much more, you know, serious, typical types of Hollywood fare. Right. The Western was not. The Western was really kind of, you know, a Tom Mix, uh, you know, or, or Harry Carey sort of shoot 'em up sort of thing. It was just, it was very much a B-picture sort of thing. It wasn't a serious thing. This was really kind of the first step out of that more B-movie, less serious or less goofy and just kind of action packed, fun-filled sort of Western. This was doing something a little more serious with the Western. And so I think to that end, I think this film does have that going for it. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, and that's why, I mean, when we talk about this, how this film made John Wayne a star, I mean, John Wayne was stuck in those films for like 10 years. Uh, he was the B, C, D, E movie Western guy and much more cartoonish. And and this this film brought him out and made him a serious Western contender for decades. Uh, and uh, as a result of John Ford really pushing for him, pushing to lift him out of that level of, of kind of uh, a cartoony obscurity. Yeah, at least at this particular point in time. I yeah. Mean, right. he, there had been plenty of uh, films that he'd made beforehand where he told John, nope, you're not ready yet. You're right. not ready yet. Right. And uh, so he was very, no, you keep doing the props for me because he, you know, I guess he was helping him with props and stuff and he right. wouldn't cast. <laughs> uh, what do you think of the uh, Dudley Nichols script? I mean, 
I like the script. I, mean, I, I read a little bit of Ernest Haycox's uh, short story. Um, it's interesting. It, it's kind of a blend of that short story, which has um, it, it kind of has the the Dallas and Ringo kind of characters in it. It doesn't. But, you know, I don't recall her being um, being a, a prostitute in that version. It sounds like he got the idea for kind of a prostitute character from a different, I think, French story. And there was another story where he kind of got some other ideas. Um, so I, my, for my understanding is John Ford saw this short story and then somehow had these other ideas and kind of got it all kind of put together and, and Dudley Nichols crafted it into this script that, I mean, I think it actually works well. I like the characters quite a bit. I mean, there are nine principal characters, you know, people, you know, we've already talked about how this is really where John Ford or John Wayne was, was, um, uh, turned into a star, but it's, I, I'm hard pressed to say it's a John Wayne picture. No, it's you know, not. It's, yeah. It really is about these nine characters on this, this stagecoach ride, um, from one town to another through, um, Apache country. Right. And, and I like these characters. Yes, they're kind of, um, some, some archetypes that we have here, but, it's it's done in a way where it feels like, um, at least in today's, you know, with today's eyes, it feels like these archetypes might be a little standard. But I think at the time they were much more, um, they they were doing something different with these archetypes, and and we had a little bit more. You know, we had the hooker with the heart of gold sort of character. We had R- the Ringo kid who was kind of uh, he was a bad guy, but you know, we kind of learned well he's only a bad guy because these these other bad guys had killed his family, and he's broken out of jail, even though he, you know, he has kind of done some bad things, but now he's just wanting to get revenge for his family. You know, I, I liked the characters. I, I liked what Dudley Nichols did with them. And I liked the journey they take. If there's a problem I have, it's the, uh, the n- treatment of the native Americans in the, in the story. Um, yes, it's a product of its time. And it's definitely something that uh, John Ford certainly dealt with in stronger, uh, better ways over the course of his career. Um, so that's that's kind of a weakness here. Um, but that being said, I still think it's a solid script. I do, too. I think, if anything, I've, I found the oh, and, and I think this is another thing that makes it stand out in the time. If I kind of put myself back there, uh, the, the pacing of the thing, the first and second act, I find a, a little bit sluggish for me, uh, although I do, to your point, uh, I, I do find that. Uh, that pacing does allow a really well balanced treatment of every one of these nine characters. Right over time, every character gets his gets his his or her moment. You know, every character uh, it, you know, we get to to learn enough about to care, so that by the time the third act hits uh, and Peacock takes an arrow in the chest, that is shocking. And and it's shocking even for Peacock, who has been, uh, uh, you know, the the sort of meekest of of all the characters. Nobody can remember his name. That's a, he's the source of he's kind of the brunt of of just enough of the whiskey jokes that that um, you know you're kind of surprised when you see him injured uh, that you care so much. And I think that is a real testament to the overall structure and to the overall pacing of the film. Even though I felt it personally a little bit sluggish, it really does work. Yeah, and I think um, you've got some really nice scenes that uh, have great character moments. And yes, the pacing might be a little off, but those are critical scenes. I love the 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 dinner scene where all the, they're all sitting down, and you've got that um, you know Ringo offers a seat to Dallas, and everybody's kind of shocked. And and um, uh, what's his name? Hatfield kind of asks Lucy, Oh, would you like to move down here? You know, you can be closer to the window or whatever, but it's all because nobody wants to sit by the prostitute and Ringo's just doesn't get it. And I, I loved all that with him and Dallas and, and just the way that those people were reacting to the whole thing. So much of that, I think is just, it's so great. So where does it start to, uh, you know, fall apart a little bit? I mean, we've talked about the establishment. I mean, this film allows us to really establish some archetypes that we see used so many times after. Is it, it does it come for you in, in John Ford and the way he uh, directs or in, in some cases doesn't? I guess so. I mean, I think that's uh, kind of the issue. And I, I think it's just directorial pacing, directorial storytelling. It's a really interesting um, thing. I mean, clearly... 
he is a filmmaker that people study to no end. I mean, he is one of, you know, one of the, the, uh, greats, as people say. Um, I, I just don't click with what he's doing here. There's a really interesting feature on the Criterion uh, disc of this where somebody's talking about how John Ford places his camera and how he, um, it kind of establishes the situation. And they look at that particular scene I was talking about at the table and how John Ford really works to avoid what you would expect is kind of a shot reverse shot. So when you see a shot of Dallas and then you see a shot of, of Lucy, instead of having the shot of Lucy, I mean, typically what you would do is the camera would be, um, when you're looking at Dallas, the camera would be just kind of off of Lucy. And then when you cut back to Lucy, the camera would be kind of in the same position, but just off of Dallas. Instead of that, he moves the camera to like the opposite end of the table to look at Lucy. And so all of a sudden you're kind of shifting, it's like shifting perspectives and it, it maybe that's what it is. And, and uh, people seem to really enjoy that about him, how he really kind of avoids doing these expected shots. But for me, I, I find that I kind of, it pulls me out from from uh, finding a better way to connect to the characters. You know, I, I, I love that they, they pull apart the, this more intimate kind of dinner scene. But for me, what, what's worth looking at in, in terms of how he and, and um, you know, uh, Burt Glennon, uh, cinematographer, uh, it, it work is really in their action stuff. It's, it's how they are able to communicate visually uh, movement. And I think it, in those cases, it works really well. And that's where it starts to shine in the third act, where you see them really pushing this stagecoach, right? I mean, it's not just, you know, moving through Apache country, little by little, stopping, having a baby. Um, it's, it's, this is kind of the, the end of the journey. They need to make it to their, to their destination. And uh, uh, crossing the river is, is one example where, you know, we, we could just get the side of, of the stagecoaches. They're lashing these giant logs onto the side of the stagecoach to, to give it float as the horses swim it across this river. That, it, it, you know, as soon as he puts the camera up over the the driver's shoulders kind of on axis uh way way up high so we see them throwing the rocks at the horses to spur them on i mean it, it, that is is a change in visual dynamic that is really shocking uh if, if you haven't seen it before and i just love it um the, the action sequences uh the their ability to keep up with the horses moving apace as they are careening across the countryside uh and and of course some of the most barbaric horse falls, um, the way they capture those is tremendously great. And uh, and I think that is, for me, how I know John Ford. I never really thought much about him as a director of intimacy. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. He does a great job with those sequences, and I really enjoy what he's doing there. And even though he's like all through the film, he's he's just it seems like he's not really very good with following the 180 degree rule where, you know, when you're cutting from one thing to the other, you got to stay on the same side of that 180 degree line. Otherwise it confuses the audience because your action or your point of reference all of a sudden seems to be switching and you don't know where things are going. And he does that all through the film, whether it's people looking at each other or the action scene and the, uh, it works really well in the action scene. It just amplifies the tension as you have this uh the stagecoach racing across the uh the uh the flatlands there and um it, it helps Foot, footnote amplify. on that because it fails in one key place but finish oh, your point sure it, it's uh but it, it does help kind of create this chaotic feel to to that whole sequence what's your footnote well just i you know where it fails really horribly for me is in the most critical place which is on the actual rescue by the cavalry right because at that point he has changed direction and we're not sure where these guys are coming from are they coming from behind are they coming from the front it turns out they're coming from the front and then the the stagecoach is actually coming toward us uh, toward the camera and and it's sort of broken the whole left right direction like you know we're 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 used to seeing progress moving in one direction on the uh, across the screen and he he sort of 
you know, breaks that enough that that it allows us to just sort of not trust so much. Um, and, and so that was that was something that that didn't work for me. But generally, I think it does work. And and where he breaks it most flagrantly, he does it, I think, well enough to actually move across the 180 degree line across axis with the camera. So we actually can see the transition, um, uh, but not always. And that's where it's confusing. I also had a problem in that particular scene um, that you just talked about where the cavalry arrives with the way that the music was done, because it just, you know, the cavalry arrives and we know that because Lucy lifts her head because she hear, hears their bugles. Right. Unfortunately, the music is written in such a way where it just sounds like the bugles are part of the music. And I had no sense that the bugles were anything that was actually in the film. I totally and, agree. And I, and she, she, until she said it, and then I'm like, oh, oh, that was supposed to be them arriving. I had no way of knowing that. Because at that point, just, she was like catatonic. It could have just as easily been the music in her head. Yeah, it just it was just it was just not a very well defined moment uh, musically. Um, they should have found a better way to kind of keep that music separated. I would keep the music separated from the bugling so that we could tell better. Yeah. Another another moment I had of of John Ford that I felt was problematic, at least for me. And I, I know some people who praise John Ford in the way that he does things really like this. But for me, the final climactic bit of the film, when John Wayne confronts the Plummer brothers and he has the shootout in the streets of Lordsburg, um, you know, we get the shot of of as they're kind of coming up on each other, we get John Wayne dropping to the ground with his gun and shooting. And then, and then we cut away from the action and we cut to Dallas. And I I appreciate that we kind of cut to the more emotional side of the story and we see her reacting to this now that she has finally kind of moved past her crappy life and has moved to a place of finding love, you know, and all of a sudden now she's, you know, having to feel this heartbreak. And I, I enjoyed that. But at the same time, it's like this is the big kind of action finale of the film. Why are we cutting away from it here? And I was actually a little disappointed. I, I, I didn't feel like that was the strongest way to direct that particular scene. I, I don't necessarily think that that the intention was off, but I do agree that it, it it the you know that it wasn't quite the best way to shoot it for me i wanted to see more of that shootout um and and i expected a shootout we got the chase we got the the uh, you know all of the the stereotypes the horse stereotypes and and we needed for me we needed a good shootout and when he hits the ground it happens across what do you think 10 frames <laughs> like he hits the ground so fast and we are gone we are out of that sequence i like the punchline to that sequence i really like the way the you know the guy come walks back and stumbles into the bar oh, yeah, and yeah. falls on his face i i i like that payoff but my goodness it felt like it, it, the the execution of the gunfight was so fast you couldn't you just couldn't keep up with it no yeah. All right. It was uh it was yeah, not not my favorite. And you know, it's I guess this is just John Ford. He's a hard person for me to connect with. I I watched an interview with him. Um he's just like this old grump and he's just so dismissive of things. It's such a strange um a strange personality and I have a hard time understanding from him if he really has some strong artistic talent that just is natural and it's just it's almost like he dismisses it because it's just there and he doesn't have to think about it or if he's just kind of you know lucking his way through (laughs) through his career doing all the stuff i i would assume the former since so many people constantly praise his work but um man i mean he just is so dismissive and and you hear actors talk about him and and you know it seems like he's this bully who would kind of would bully his actors into getting performances out of them and stuff i'm just like gosh i just don't know if i like this guy that much but. yeah yeah it's it's hard to be a fan when that's the that's the uh the their sort of cultural memory right you know it's really hard to be a fan it reminds me to be nicer to people right, right you right, never right. know and it's, you know 80 years. He did say, um, there's an interview with uh, Louise Platt, who played Lucy, um, an interview with her actually not too long ago, just before she passed away, I think. Um, she was talking about it because she had, I think this was one of her first films. I think she had come from the stage 
And uh, it was the youngest actor on the set at the time. And so she was really nervous about this. And and so she acted her first shot at the dining table is what the, they first filmed. Um, she did her lines. John Ford came over to her and uh, he leaned toward her and said, I don't want a Virginia accent. I don't want any charm. This gal is cold as a rock. And she said, look, it says it in the script. She's a Virginian with a musical accent, charming and polite. Um, and his reply was, that's Dudley's direction, the screenwriter, not mine. I think a movie is for the eye. Dudley thinks it's for the ear. His next film will no, about, no, no doubt be three hours long. I like a minimum of dialogue. Dudley loves verbiage. And so she, so she went back and played it cold. And that's, you know, that worked. That was what he was looking for. So the one thing that I really love about John Ford is he has some shots that seem to be pretty consistent with the way that he likes to tell his stories. He loves getting these shots of like, you get a dark interior looking through a door and you got like just this, there's a a couple great shots here. Uh, The one that stands out for me is I, when um, when I think Dallas walks down the hallway and out the door at the end and then, and then, uh, Ringo goes after her, but it's just this dark hallway with this glowing white door at the end, and he kind of goes through, and and he does that a couple times, and it's just such a great thing, you know. He he does that great in the Searchers uh, a few times. I mean, it's it's a it's a nice way to kind of separate the the interior life from the exterior, and I, I like what he's doing there. Um, and he also does that through windows where you've got like that great shot toward the beginning when uh, Lucy is talking with her friends inside the hotel. And uh, they're talking about Hatfield and his, he's this gambler and and she turns and looks and he's standing outside. We see him standing outside watching her and she turns and looks at him and he kind of turns and walks away. And it's just like there's it, there's great separation. And I love that he does that. So that's that's definitely a John Ford um, thing that uh, definitely a trope that he puts in here and, and does a good job here with Bert. I think his his introductions too, his visual introductions, particularly John Wayne. I mean, when he does that yeah. that sort of dolly slam in to introduce us to John Wayne on his uh, right on his face while he's holding the saddle in the middle of the desert, uh, I thought that was just that that was terrific and dramatic and just really lovely. Uh, and and again, back to his action stuff, some of the ways, some of the places he put that camera in and around the stagecoach were. They just blew me away under the stagecoach just blew me away. I thought at the time in particular, I mean, these aren't GoPros, um, you know, getting getting these shots. I, I couldn't figure out how he was able to do it. No, I agree. I, there's a lot of great stuff that uh, they were doing here to really try to put things in different places. I mean, thinking back to. Uh, when we're talking about High Noon, which it wasn't all on a stagecoach or, or a wagon, but right. there was a little bit. There was yeah. a little bit. And there was one shot that really stood out to us. Uh, it was the across the wheel shot. Yeah, it was it's kind of that, you know, funky position on the side of the wagon. It was great. Um, and you look at something like this, which happened before that. It's like, wow, there's so many more options <laughs> yeah. to choose from. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Yeah. Um, production design. Uh, what'd you think of the old West? And, and I think this is particularly interesting in the context of lo- the discussion around location in Monument Valley. Yes. And, and no, I mean, I did want to say as far as production design goes that, you know, this was like John Ford and his production designer, they put ceilings in here and it's definitely a, a key point. Um, you definitely see a lot of ceilings as you're looking around here, um, it was uh, Alexander Tol- Toloboff who did mm-hmm. the art direction here. And um, it's uh, kind of a precursor to Citizen Kane. Uh, you know, and everybody talked about Orson Welles and the ceilings, you know, the fact that you see ceilings in the sets. Um, it was done here first, folks. And, uh, you know, this is kind of where Orson Welles got it. So uh, good to see that here. I agree. Uh, why did and, you say yes and no? I felt like you were going to contradict me about something. No, no, no. Well, because you were talking about it's it's about the exteriors here, and I just wanted to throw that one interior bit in. Oh, I see. Yes. But yes, uh-huh. exteriors, there's a lot of uh, great exteriors here. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know. It's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of Movie Conversation. 
It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reels logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. Well, and that's one of the things I think is so interesting about this, and it's the story of Harry Golding. Did you read about Harry Golding? Oh, yes. Harry Golding is a kind of a popular dude in it's the 30s. Pretty interesting story, yeah. Very interesting story. So, you know, we already mentioned this was the this was a location western. It really was the first great kind of location western. And and I I found it really interesting that much of the uh, uh I think of the intention of moving it to the west, I think discovering this beautiful location uh, of Monument Valley is, uh, you know, that had been unsullied, unspoiled, undiscovered, uh, was great for the film, clearly. But uh, the fact that Ford hated producers so much and, and executives, studio executives so much, that he wanted to cho- shoot on location that was really hard to get to, that was dirty, that was hot and rugged so that producers wouldn't want to go there. I found that really delightful. And, and again, going back to the grumpy John yeah, Ford. Yeah, <laughs> he's just a grumpy John Ford. So I, as much as I think the intention of shooting in the West was good for the film, I think it was also really for for Ford uh, to do this. In any case, this Harry Goulding fellow, uh, he and his wife, Mike, uh, were had ended up out here in Navajo, Navajo land in Monument Valley, and they discovered this beautiful place and, and uh, it became – really close to the Navajo people and learned the language, incredibly difficult language, uh, really became kind of a centerpiece to uh, their lives there. And then the economy trashed and they needed to, uh, he said there was no work coming through. So they, he had this idea, uh, uh, you know, maybe we can go sell the idea of, of shooting movies uh, in this area to Hollywood and introduced it or certainly facilitated it. Apparently, according to the history, there are different histories about who actually discovered Monument Valley, whether it was Ford, whether it was, you know, producers, but, um, whether it was John Wayne even, uh, but, but it is undisputed that it was, it was Harry Goulding and his relationship with the Navajo that he was able to facilitate a, a relationship that allowed this movie to be made there, not only to be made there, but for the Navajo people to participate in the film, to write the horses to to uh, uh, you know to to be um, a principal in the in the production of it um, get paid union wages and get paid union wa- wages exactly I, I think that is a that is a real testament to just how much he uh, he Goulding um, really loved this relationship and in fact you know we talk about grumpy Ford uh, it is reputed that this the relationship between Ford and Goulding was the only really nice respectful relationship that that Ford had uh, that he really respected Goulding and and uh, uh, ended up shooting other movies there he shot uh, seven movies here um and, uh, you know, I think it was, it's an interesting thing because there was definitely some, uh, you know, I, I think John Ford respected the Navajo who, uh, live in the Monument Valley area. Um, but I, I, I feel like, um, there had to be some level of kind of that, um, meta sense that he's also there just like, the white man kind of 
exploiting the Native Americans across the country as they kind of took over. He was coming in here and exploiting these Navajos to to uh, make his movies. And, uh, you know, he he cast these Navajo to play all different uh, Native Americans, whether it was Apache or uh, I think we see a Cheyenne at the beginning or or, uh, you know, just anyone. Uh, he just kind of kept them. It's just like, oh, you know, we'll just kind of cast you as the kind of the eponymous Native American characters mm -hmm. and, and just use you however I needed to. And I think that's kind of what he did. And, I, you know, I think that they, you know, I mean, it, you know, there was a lot of money coming in. And so, I, you know, it's one of those things where it, there's a there's a kind of a, a, a yin and yang to it, I definitely think. But all of that being said, I think that Goulding and uh, the deals that he made with the Navajo to film in Monument Valley up on the uh, at the Arizona Utah border um, did end up kind of creating this this uh, this expectation kind of of what people thought of as the old west and you know John Ford shot so many films here and a lot of other people came to film here it kind of became that thing to represent that i mean geez we talked about national lampoon's vacation that film here that was here yeah yeah right. it's 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 this very popular place to shoot because it looks so good and i mean i can't tell you how often i'm looking for crew people uh to go work on a project and they're up in the Monument Valley area filming a commercial or whatever it is, because people always want to go film there. It's still just incredibly popular and, um, and it's beautiful and you can still go there. I mean, Gouldings is still there. You can go to Gouldings.com and you can, uh, you know, make a reservation and just go check it out and uh, hang out up there. It's a, it's a cool little corner to, to look at. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things. I, I, I feel like there's always going to be a little, uh, good and bad as far as the way that, um, the, the white man kind of came in and, 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 uh, and took over America. That being said, it is a truly beautiful area. Well, it's a truly beautiful area. And I think what's, what's really cool about the story, uh, is it, it's all in the heart of this guy, Harry Goulding and his relationship with the Navajo. That is what's worth celebrating. And the problem happened as usual when, you know, the rest of commerce kind of, um, and, and sort of capital production, uh, came into the into the picture. But I, I think it's it's just worth noting that it was all it all started with sort of the right intention with a guy who who, you know, as far as I gathered, uh, had a real sort of positive and, and healthy relationship and and uh, one of mutual respect at the time, which was hard to come by. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, can we talk about Yakima Canute? We should. Man, this guy knew how to throw himself around and what a he's like the villain in the animal rights story if there was a musical about <laughs> animal rights uh violations it would it would be the story of yakima canute yeah boy dark dark uh the good stuff yakima canute was a former silent film actor who apparently had kind of a funky voice and didn't make the transition to talkies uh so he became a champion rodeo star and eventually back into acting as a as a uh, stunt person uh, and is incredibly talented at what he does. And when you look at the at jumping from horse to horse, the, the sequence on the stagecoach, when you look at the the stagecoach slide under the coach uh, part, which is, um, you know, widely reputed to be the the uh, scene that is taken as an homage in, in Indiana Jones and a number of other uh, uh, other films that have done something similar of the the character sliding uh, across the ground of a vehicle or stagecoach moving uh, at full speed uh, coming out the other side. It, incredibly dangerous um, and really well respected in, in the stunt community. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a, it's amazing the stuff that he would do here. And we talked about him, I think, on the Gone with the Wind episode because I think we did because he did uh, something in that as well. I, I feel like something with the the burning of Atlanta. I can't remember exactly, but he was around uh, doing a lot of stunts for a lot of films. And he kind of set the bar pretty high at uh, an early time in in uh, cinema as far as uh, how to do great stunts. So he's definitely one of those guys. And I feel like when the Academy finally gets around to uh, getting a, uh, you know, best uh, stunt performer 
or whatever it's going to be, Oscar, I feel like they should call it the Yakima. <laughs> <laughs> Which is better than the Canute. <laughs> the Canute. <laughs> so he is known uh, as being an iconic stunt performer, but he's also known as, as you know, the guy who, yes, hurt animals. Yes, uh, in the Running W. In, yeah, in particular horses. Did you are, were you familiar with the Running W before you read up on him? I I knew that they came up with something to make the horses fall. Um, I mean, that's something that we talked about back when I watched this in uh, film uh, intro to film mm-hmm. in my first year of college. How did but, they portray it in your first year of college? I, I, they didn't. They just said, you know, they came up with something to trip the horses is basically, I think, kind of the extent of it. I don't think we had as much detail then as we do now. It's, it's not very nice if you're a horse. Uh, apparently, it, it it the wires are attached to the horse's front legs. This is this is what they call the running W. Yes, uh, and they're threaded through a ring on a cinch and secured to buried dead weights, such that when the horse runs at full speed to the end of those wires, the front legs are yanked out from under him. And so what we see in Stagecoach are these incredibly dramatic falls as these, and and they're sort of ridiculous falls, right? They don't kind of fit physics, because what we see is people on the stagecoach shooting at these Native Americans uh, on that are riding on horses. And when they shoot them on the horses, you would expect them to fall off like backwards or sideways, right? But instead, the horse falls down on its neck really, really hard. And that's what the running well, W does. It's like the horse gets shot in the chest or something and collapses but, but that, what it's supposed to look like, I think. I, it's, uh, sure, but then they leave the camera running too long because the number of times when the horse falls and then yeah, gets right. up and runs away uh, right. means that that just can't be possible. Right. Right. right? That we can't have that assumption that the horse is somehow injured. And so uh, the physics of it just fails left and right. But the effect is incredibly dramatic. And this was thanks to the, the uh, diabolical ingenuity of Yakima Knut. Uh, inventing this running W. It's just a terrible thing. We see it all over the place in this film in particular. There's so many horses uh, chasing the stagecoach across the third act, uh, and many of them tumble as a result of, of this trick. Yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty gruesome to watch. I mean, I, it, it shocked me every time I'd see the horse get up. I'm like, how is the yeah. horse getting up after that? I mean, jeez. Yeah. I mean, they really take a beating. It It just looks like they just... Yeah, I I don't even know. It just looks horrible. Yeah. So was it was it Yakima who was also responsible for getting the stagecoach across the river? Was that his idea? That was his idea. Yeah, he he uh, had it on a on a cable and uh, just kind of pulled the cable, pulled it along the cable as it went across. So it didn't float down the river at all. The horses could just kind of pull it straight across. And uh, yeah, so I mean, he's he was a clever fella. Clever fella. His expertise really in rigging. Makes him just um, sort of a legendary character in the stunt community. Um, what about let's uh, let's start running through these uh, the nine principal characters. Yes, definitely. Uh, John Wayne as Ringo the Kid. Again, we've already said this isn't really a John Wayne film, but it's he's definitely in it. He's definitely in it, and you know, I mean, in the end, I feel like the way that all the other characters disperse and it leaves the focus to be on him and Dallas's relationship, it does end up, even though you really focus on the nine, it does end up feeling like it's kind of their story. Yeah. I mean, he comes in the last, he, he's the last character that we meet on this, on this trip. So uh, we don't get him for the, you know, the whole first act really. Yeah. In terms of screen time, you know, this yeah. is much more of a Claire Trevor yeah. uh, film. Yeah. Um, he is. Uh, did you see the 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 one of the sp- criterion pieces was, uh, uh, ironically, Peter Bogdanovich talking right. about uh, John Wayne. He said, you know, John Wayne had had called himself. They say he's an action star. He says, I'm not an action star. I'm a reaction star. And and that this was the film that really got him that uh, gave him that uh, name that uh, or that nickname because of the number of sequences in which we don't see that the only re- reason John Wayne is still in the sequence is because he's reacting to it, uh, where he doesn't have anything really to say at all. He just uh, we get to to watch him 
watch him respond to the rest of the sequence. Uh, do you agree? Yeah, I think that seems uh, to be a pretty valid point about John Wayne. I mean, he's never never been one of my favorites, but I mean, I can enjoy him. I, I think that I get uh, wrapped up in a lot of John Wayne's personal politics and uh, the way that he uh, dealt with things like the blacklist and things like that in Hollywood. You know, the, I, I have a lot of problems with some of his personal choices, um, but I mean, I I can enjoy watching a john wayne film mm -hmm. uh you know I, I i can separate those in my mind and and i i uh, um i i don't think he's an actor that i really see a lot out of he always feels like he's just john wayne in the in the film but you know i, I he's still fun to watch i guess what about claire trevor man i just love claire trevor <laughs> you know she uh broke our hearts uh singing that song in key largo when yeah. we talked about that and uh man i i think that she's just so good as dallas i mean you you really feel uh, just the pain that she has in getting kind of pushed out and dismissed and looked down upon and you never see her you know she's you know, kind of that hooker with the heart of gold sort of character you never see her you know obviously you're not going to see her kind of doing her craft um, back in the film in the thirties, but you, you don't get a sense of her outside of just being kind of a good person, just stuck in a really bad situation. And I, I really like that character. And I think that she portrays that pain really well. Well, you can kind of see that with every character in here. That's one of the things that's so nice about oh, yeah. the way they use these archetypes is they are all fundamentally misunderstood by the system. Uh, and, and she's the first one we get to see that, uh, where, you know, she is kicked out by the ladies of the community who, you know, the, the ladies of integrity, uh, who kick her out. But, um, you know, her, as she says, I just want to live. Is there anything wrong with me just living? <laughs> Uh, right. And it's just so sad to to kind of watch her have to to live in that kind of ideologue. Uh, so uh, I thought she was great. Yeah, she's she's really fantastic. I mean, to me, she really is kind of the reason that I would want to return to this because I really enjoyed watching her character through the course of it. I agree. Uh, what about Andy Devine? He is that that guy who just has a voice he kind of has that voice that's perpetually cracking that just it's you know there's a um uh a, the character in uh in i have to look now in uh um uh who framed roger rabbit that it's it's the little cartoon bullet character oh yeah yeah <laughs> when when he finally pulls uh pulls it out uh Right at the end there. Nope. Uh, yeah. Andy Devine had died long before then. Um, but he was Friar Tuck in yeah, Robin Hood. In Robin Hood. Robin Hood. That's what I was thinking. That's where I thought you were going with that, that he was, uh, um, that was, because that's how I remember him. Right, uh, right. Is much later than uh, in his career, certainly in my but, life. But the bullet character definitely seems like it's meant to be kind of an Andy Devine. Yeah, it was an homage. Yeah, right. right. Exactly. With that kind of cracked voice. And I'm, I, gosh, he's just great to listen to him talk. And he's just I, I almost found like him to be kind of the one who was always kind of surprising me, you know, talking about his Mexican wife and yeah. just the, his life <laughs> and back back in uh, in Lordsburg and everything. I, I just really enjoyed I enjoyed his character quite a bit. He's in what I remember as a, a really the the only film that I remember that is classified as madcap and also really boring. Uh, it's a mad, 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 mad world. <laughs> Do you ever see that? Yeah. I mean, I remember enjoying it. I don't remember loving it, but uh, three and a half hours that movie was. I know it was a long one. Well, anyway, he was in that. And he'd been in another or a number of other uh, John Ford films, like yes. Shot Liberty Valance yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. So, uh, uh, who else is on our list? John Carradine, Hatfield. I, you know, boy, he looks like a walking skeleton here. Yeah, he's. He, it's a really interesting character because he's the gambler we get right away, but then he shows himself to be, you know, a real gentleman. I mean, a real gentleman in the refined sort of way where he does everything he can to kind of help Lucy while still looking down upon Dallas. Um, but I, I enjoyed that, that, you know, 
we, you know, get a sense that, oh, this is this bad guy. But then we find out, you know, he had served in Lucy's father's army and uh, there's a lot more to him. Uh, he was a very mysterious character, but I, I, I thought that Carradine uh, did nice with him. He was he's got 350 credits on his IMDb page. You, yeah, it, it, it's not so bad as the guy we talked about last week. What was his name with over a thousand credits? Uh, <laughs> 1,500. <laughs> 1,500 credits. Right. Yeah. Uh, but he wasn't a lot of stuff. He died in 88 and still ended up in movies uh, through 1995 that uh, I guess he had already shot. Um, but he is he's he's one of those that I think I um, uh, I remember much more later. Uh, seeing him in some of the more sort of pulpy things that he ended up doing, but um, um, I, I, he was in *Grapes of Wrath* and also in yeah. *Shot Liberty Valance*. So another guy who had worked a number of times with, um, with John Ford. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. How about uh, Thomas Mitchell, Doc? Yeah, this was we, his busy year. <laughs> yeah, we have talked about him a bunch in 1939. I know. I, I think this may be the last time, unfortunately. It makes me sad. But, I mean, he was in Gone with the Wind. He was in Only Angels Have Wings. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. He was also in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Uh, we're not talking about that one. But, yeah, he's, uh, gosh, he's just a busy man. Um, this is, he won Best Supporting Actor for this performance here. Beating out Harry Carey and Claude Rains, both in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And then also Brian Ahern in Juarez and Brian Donlevy in Bo Jest. Um, I haven't seen those last two, but I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if they gave it to him because he just appeared in so much stuff and they're like, oh, well, we really enjoyed him and we should give him an award or what. But I mean, personally, I probably would have gone with Claude Rains. Absolutely. Either that or I would have said, you know, Thomas Mitchell is great, but I mean, personally, I kind of preferred him in Mr. Smith. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that was what I was going to. Uh, that was my perspective, too, that this was uh, I don't know. It sort of feels like the even then the Academy was still all up for uh, clean and sober stories. And yeah, right. You know, this was kind of him. He was the drunk and he was the drunk doctor, no less, who gets sober to deliver a baby like, uh, you know, that's that's a hero story that I think the the Academy was soft for. Well, for me, it was the it was the moment toward the end when he stands up to Luke to to yep. warn him from taking the shotgun out into the streets because you know having a gunfight out in the streets was okay, but not if you bring a shotgun. And then it's right. a murder. <laughs> it's murder. <laughs> I was like, this is a Western Western rules. I don't quite get, but okay. But I love but, it even more that at the end of that standoff, he gets the guy to put down the shotgun, and then literally wipes his brow. Like, wow, that was stressful. Woo. Yeah. Well, and I love that he looks at the bartenders just like, don't ever let me do that again. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I wrote in my notes, I'm like, is that is that line why he won the Oscar? Because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was actually, I, I liked that one quite a bit. Yeah. So, who knows? But he's great. I just love seeing Thomas Mitchell. Uh, Louise Platt. Yeah, playing Lucy. Um, yeah, I already talked about her a little bit as far as kind of uh, getting coached by uh, John Ford. The only other thing I wanted to say about her is, man, is she quiet when she's pushing a baby out. <laughs> it's like, geez. I feel like we can speak with some authority on that. That is really quiet. <laughs> yeah. Like they go into the back room. That's all. You don't yeah. hear a thing. Yep. Not a peep. <laughs> <laughs> but she was mostly catatonic throughout the film. Like she was not in a good space. No, she's she is like uh, John Ford wanted, you know, very cold. And I uh, I liked that. And I, I liked her development. And I like how at the end, even when she's uh, laying on the uh, on the cot as they are carrying her away and she talks to Dallas, she's still, you know, you can tell that she wants to kind of apologize and kind of make good, but she still is like really kind of closed off and it's hard for her to do that. And I, I appreciate that in that, in the way they wrote that character. Yeah. I th see, I think that's on that. We disagree. I found her a non entity in this film. And I, I just, every time we had to focus on a bit of her story, I was looking at my watch. I just didn't I didn't see it. I saw the quiet delivery as misdirection uh, on, on the part of John Ford, I, that he just was not able to bring out a character that for me was worth paying attention to. Yeah. So uh, how about George Bancroft as Marshall Curley? You know, he's great. Um, I, I really enjoy uh, just his bit. I mean, he's he feels like one of those one of those faces that's just been around forever. I mean, 
I think he had uh, also been in other John Ford uh, things. Um, I think, um, gosh, what was it um, before this? Wasn't it? Uh, was it? Uh, which one was it? Was well, it I don't Thunderbolt? know. Uh, no, before that was Stage Coach? Yeah. That, that he did with uh, Ford. I thought he did another John Ford thing. I don't know. Before this, but uh, I could be wrong. Anyway. Hmm. Um, but he does have a great face. Yes, he does. Uh, the, the, I think most, uh, well, I don't know. The most fun character for me is poor Donald Meek plays Samuel Peacock and nobody can ever remember his name. We already brought him up. Uh, he's another, uh, uh, kind of iconic face. And, uh, he's got the perfect name. Yeah. Right. To play Peacock because he is so meek. <laughs> Uh, he uh, is delightful in this thing. I wish I sort of wish we had more of him. He plays the the whiskey. What, what was his job? Did you have understand what his job was? Well, he's a whiskey salesman. But they used a different word. They did whiskey I, beater I, or something like that. I can't remember. I can't remember now. Anyway, I didn't know if there's. A, I don't know. Is there a process with the whiskey that you beat it at any point in making it? I've never heard of this. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow. Uh, Burton Churchill plays Ellsworth Henry Gatewood. It's kind of an interesting thing. This is another one of those stereotypes that kind of gets turned. He's the banker. He's the, you know, what's good for the ba- community is good for the bank and and um, uh, good for the country is good for the bank or maybe it's the other way around. Anyway, he ends up being the crook. Uh, so it's kind of a timely film. Yeah, it's, uh, man, I know that just made me laugh. I'm just like, boy, nobody's ever Have, just like bankers. Yeah. They just. Have we know. learned nothing? It's like, funny. Uh, in the old uh, the movie booklet that came out when uh, the movie was released, uh, they say about him, they say, um, a pillar of society, but the termites had gotten to him. The termites of greed. Jeez. <laughs> oh, oh, that's great. Uh, how about uh, our the, the uh, Lieutenant Blanchard, Tim Holt, uh, Tom Tyler is Luke Plummer, and of course, Chief John Bigtree. It's great seeing Tim Holt uh, pop up. He looks like such a baby here. Um, I mean, gosh, he's just, uh, you know, he pops up in, uh, you know, a few years uh, later after uh, Orson Welles did Citizen Kane and he did Magnificent Ambersons. He's in that. And I, you know, I think he's just one of those just great actors who is just always fun to watch. And it's it's fun seeing him here when he looks like a little baby and then going back to something like Treasure of this Sierra Madre. I was just going to say, I mean, we talked and, about him as Curtain. Yeah, and just seeing him there. I mean, he's just uh, he's just one of those guys who just has a great face. And it's just, it's so funny seeing him here when he looks so young. Absolutely. Well, and we could say the same about John Wayne. He looked really young in this film. He did look yeah. really young. Yes, he did. Yeah. Uh, anybody else you're excited about before we move through it? I think the only other person I was going to mention was um, uh, Chief John Bigtree. Yes, sir. Uh, he is, uh, at the time of this, my understanding is he was like the the most uh, popular Native American actor um, at the time. And uh, he, we see him right at the beginning. He's the He plays the Cheyenne Scout at the beginning of the film who... Um, is filling these guys in on the fact that Geronimo is out there. Right. And everything. But, oh, uh, he's yeah. Cheyenne. He hates the Apache. <laughs> That's right. Right. So they're not worrying. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it was, uh, I don't really have much to say about him other than, yeah, he was kind of a big Native American actor at the time. And, uh, um, I don't see that many credits, uh, for him. But even 1939, you know, one, two, Three, four, five films. Destry rides again. Drums along the Mohawk, the Oregon Trail, Susanna of the Mounties, and this. So, well, and look at his list of credits, though, and look at how many of them are uncredited Indian. Yeah, right, right. Talk about a sad sign of the times, right there. Yep, definitely. Uh, okay, there you go. You said the music uh, for you was. Well, you you were speaking specifically about that sequence where the music was meh. Uh, overall, do you find the music any, uh, any better for the rest of the film? Well, I didn't say it was meh at that place. I just felt that it was mis, misused the way that, the you know, horns it, it, and the... yeah, it just, it blended everything incorrectly. I felt, um, but I, I, you know, John Ford apparently doesn't like, um, overscoring or underscoring. He doesn't like having score in his films, but he really loves folk songs. And this score is really just made up of tons of folk songs. Like, you know, I dream of genie with the light brown hair and just tons of others. It's just coursing through the film 
And as it, it, as you listen to it, you can really hear all the different uh, tunes in there if you're familiar with the songs. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting way to do it. Um, it's I, I don't know if it's uh, if I'm a huge fan of it. Um, it was also done in like How the West Was Won. Uh, I, you know, I like it enough, I guess. Um, and I, I, I think the music is, it, it works here, but, uh, I feel like I would prefer it done in other ways. Yeah, I agree with you. I found it not terribly memorable. I've and mostly because I already know the tunes and I didn't find that it, it you know, I agree with you. When I noticed the music, it was usually because I was noticing something that struck me sideways. Uh, and otherwise I didn't notice the music. So. Yeah. Um, all right. Other things that we need to remember to talk about with this uh, with this film, Mandy. What are those you know, things? The only other thing that it, we when we did we we're talking about kind of this the concept of this film and the story. It just felt like you know we didn't really sell it that well. As far as uh, another thing that uh, Ford was doing here, and that's really kind of showing kind of this this expanding of America and the growth of America. And, you know, these, these nine people kind of are representing kind of a, a, a bit of culture as, as America is growing. And I think that's, you know, it's an interesting way to kind of step outside of this film and look at it and going, okay, yeah, there's there, you know, he can be kind of putting that, putting a, uh, a spin on, on kind of the founding of our country and, people with problems and and how nobody's perfect and this kind of growth growth of this country and how people uh kind of work to get along in order to make america great i i think there's something interesting there i don't know if i've really thought about it long enough to really kind of lock it in but i feel like there is something there that uh, ford is doing well it it sort of wears its symbolism on its sleeve right it it starts when the baby's born and there are the number of times that we cut back to the baby during the act 3 escapades the action as the baby is this symbol of innocence that is thrusting across this wild untamed land right this is the, it is just a little white baby that has no uh, mal intention and it's just it's just supposed to stand up and represent that we have uh, that we bring greatness to this land you know especially considering this is a western and westerns weren't serious at the time and right. and i liked that they were actually doing something different with a western so i mean i i appreciate it on that level the only other thing that i i thought was worth uh mentioning was how just i mean other than the fact that these plumber brothers either had a, a, a death wish or they were kind of in this situation where they're like well Ringo's here. We're going to die. I guess we have no choice other than to walk out and face our death. But geez, like every sign is telling them to not do this. You know, they're, <laughs> he's playing poker and, and he gets aces and eights, the dead man's hand, you know, and, and then he and his, uh, two idiot brothers are out like walking and they see a black cat run past him and his brother tries shooting <laughs> at the black cat and he misses, and he and misses. Like four feet away. <laughs> he missed the cat. <laughs> It's like, God, these guys are missing every sign that this is a bad, bad thing to walk into. <laughs> oh, that man. is so great. They're, they're <laughs> all idiots. That is, they it's lampoon like, themselves. It was too good. It was, man, it was like, these guys really are just missing it. They should just not go into this, this uh, shootout. You wonder, again, if it's just those isolated elements that as they shoot, you know, uh, shoot out of order or what out of sequence that that maybe at the end you wonder if John Ford sits there and watches the whole film all the way through and says, gosh, I probably shouldn't have put all those back to back. Right. <laughs> It is hard to believe we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You're telling me producing this show week after week is so much fun, but it does require a lot of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. The Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals links to the source material for all of our adapted film discussions. Purchasing through our links supports the show. In season 13, we explore various awards categories and the films nominated in them. We wrapped up our 1940 Best Picture series with adaptations of Mice and Men from John Steinbeck and Wuthering Heights from Emily Bronte's novel, not to mention the play Dark Victory by George Brewer Jr. and Bertram Block. The 1947 Academy Award adapted screenplay series featured Anna and the King of Sun 
I Am, based on Margaret Langdon's book, plus The Best Years of Our Lives, Brief Encounter, and The Killers. The 1952 cinematography nominees included Death of a Salesman and A Streetcar Named Desire, A Place in the Sun, based on both a play and a book, and Strangers on a Train, based on Patricia Highsmith's first novel. So many great movies based on books and plays, like Beckett, The Pumpkin Eater, A Boy and His Dog, Rollerball, The Princess Bride, Congo, The Scarlet Letter, Jackie Brown, The Deep End, The Gray, The Woman in Black, and Top Gun Maverick, which I'm very much looking forward to revisiting. Get the source books at thenextreel.com slash originals. Start your next read or reread from the movies we've covered. Visit thenextreel.com slash originals today. What else do we need to talk about with this film, Andy? It seems like it has been uh, remade uh, a couple of times. Well, and uh, you did mention awards uh, earlier. It did win, uh, like I said, for Thomas Mitchell, Best Supporting Actor. It also yep. won. Uh, it won the uh, no. It was nominated for uh, for Best Picture, Director, Black and White Cinematography, Art Direction, and Best Film Editing. And uh, oh yes, and it did win for Best Music Scoring. So, which which is weird. Yeah, because yeah, I feel like didn't I thought Gone with the Wind won that? Why am I uh, misremembering that? Best uh, Wizard of Oz won Best Original Song. Uh, Wizard of Oz won Best Music Original Score. Stagecoast won Best Music Scoring, as in it took existing music <laughs> and and scored it against film. He took the music and stuff, but did, I mean, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington also fell into that category. Hmm. And did did they do that with Mr. I, I guess I can't remember the music in Mr. Smith now. I don't either. Well, there you go. There you That's, go. It's uh, a mystery. It's an early Oscars mystery. Very strange little thing. Yeah, that is a very strange thing. But uh, yeah, this film, uh, like you said, it was uh, remade. Um, it's you know I we you briefly mentioned a Walter Wanger who was the uh, the producer or Wang, Wanger I think is how you actually say it. Yeah, um, I've heard it. <laughs> Please don't say it, ways. Wanger. Please. Wanger. Yes. Please don't say that. W- Wanger. Wanger. Um, he, uh, you know, he, he's the one who produced this film, even though it's, you know, it's interesting as a producer of the film, he actually wrote a letter to somebody about some of the publicity for this and said, um, which was, I really like to see. He's just like, you know, I really want people to just be aware that this is that you know, I, I want the credit to go where credit is due. This is John Ford's achievement. It was interesting to see a producer <laughs> saying that. Like, wow, that's really generous. So I kind of like that. But yeah, this film, um, it changed hands a number of times because he kind of produced it outside of the system. And um, I think at the time when it was released, United Artists released it. And then with their seven-year rights rule, they had to surrender distribution and back to Walter Wanger. And then a bunch of different independent companies uh, produced it for, or uh, you know, took care of it for a while. It ended up, uh, the copyright was renewed by 20th Century Fox. And while they held it, they did a remake in 1966 of Stagecoach. And um, then it's switched around a bunch of other times. And I think right now um, it's with uh, Shout Factory and Warner Brothers, I think. So who knows? But uh, the film itself, it was, uh, you know, all prints apparently were lost or destroyed and they actually had to uh, make the print that uh, we're seeing today john ford had one positive print that had never been through a projector and so um, he let them use that to make a new negative and that's the negative that they've been using since to uh to uh, uh, get it out into the world it's unfortunate though because even that has uh suffered a lot of damage and so yeah, it's not I, it's, good no it's hard to find a uh you know there's just there's not that pristine print sitting out there and and so it's unfortunate it's just it's interesting that this is you know th- despite any issues that people may have with some of these studios there are benefits like maintaining of of some of these uh, classic films uh you know the actual stock of films that they use to uh, to print them. It it did make me wonder as much as people talk about this why there hasn't been more of a lobby for a complete restoration. Like it, you know this was not it just it doesn't look good. And I I think so much of the uh um so much of the texture of, you know, Monument Valley uh, is missing in just these t- just a terrible transfer in in some sequences. And so I you know I I was moved nearly Andy to write a strongly worded Amazon review. 
Well, you know, it's, it's, it is funny though. I mean, cause this, uh, you know, this actually is the restored version. I mean, I, I don't know which, like where you ended up watching it, but, um, the, I mean, the version I watched was the Blu-ray that Criterion has out there. Mine was the Criterion Hulu. Yeah, so it's probably the same, the same thing. Yeah. But, um, yeah, they, um, they, they found a 1942 nitrate duplicate negative that showed exceptional detail, grayscale and clarity. That was the primary source for the new HD digital transfer um, because they believe it's the best surviving um, uh, film material of Stagecoach. And so, uh, but even then, it still suffers a lot of scratches and yeah. debris. And, and uh, it, you know, they did hundreds of hours of restoration to actually remove lots of damage already. So imagine yeah. what it looked like before. Yeah, right. Um, this film, uh, it was uh, successful. It cost $531,374 to make at the time. All right. Very specific uh, budgeting numbers uh, provided by Walter yeah. Wanger. That's pretty good. That's about $8.9 million in adjusted today's dollars. Um, all, uh, yeah, it, all told, it ended up making about $1.1 million, adjusted about $18.5 million. So it ended up grossing an adjusted profit per finished minute of about 99000 her finished minutes. So, you know, little stagecoach uh, did pretty well for itself. All right, Andy, we should probably rank it. Let's do it. All right. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel and sign into your account there because by now I'm sure you have one. And you just do a little search. Do a little search for stagecoach 1939. It'll pop right up and you get ready for the filmo a filmo matchup of uh, of the century right here. Stagecoach versus First up, Stagecoach versus the Bad Seed. You know, stagecoach. Yeah, totally stagecoach. Stagecoach or Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Yes, absolutely. Eternal Sunshine. Stagecoach or Sunshine. Sunshine. Yeah, I'll do Sunshine. I have third act, third act issues still, but uh, boy, there's But a it bounces lot of out stuff. because I have first and second act issues with. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, stagecoach or the Born Identity. Born Identity. Born identity. Stagecoach or Viridiana. Um, this is only moderately trickier. I'm still going to go with Viridiana. Yeah, me too. Stagecoach or Mad Max. Mad Max Mad for Max, me. yeah, hands down. Stagecoach or Hot Fuzz. Absolutely Hot Fuzz. <laughs> Absolutely. And let's see, Stagecoach or Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? <laughs> Oh brother! Oh brother! It's kind of a late end. Uh, yeah. Oh brother! Block uh, that's that left it at uh, number one sixteen. So this might be. I mean this this is coming in like pretty much smack dab in the middle, that's right exactly between Oh brother it. and the bad seed. <laughs> this may be our new block, Pete. <laughs> it I, might be the stagecoach block now. Wow. You know what? That That's exactly where it is. Because moving into Letterboxd and our star rating, this is a three-star movie. And to me, a three-star movie is right in the middle of our overall ranking. Yeah. It just feels this, right. Is, yeah. For me, this, uh, I don't know. I'm I'm kind of torn going back between three, three and a half. I think I'm going to say, I think I'll go three and a half. So I'm a little, I'm just a slightly bit higher than you. What is it that pushes it over for you? You're the one, you have a bigger problem with John Ford than I do. I do, but at the same time, I, you know, that Claire Trevor, there's a lot of good stuff with Claire Trevor in here. And I, and I really do, despite my problems with John Ford, I really like the stuff that they're doing here. I like these characters. I think there's a lot of really great, uh, um, just a blend of of these characters coming together throughout the story. I do too. I just a little bit less, and that's okay. All right. And Pete, there's one thing I totally forgot to mention. Oh, okay. Where is the shot with the car in the background? I watched the chase scene or so many times, trying to like look in the back of every single shot because supposedly. In the background of one shot, you can see a car driving across the background on a road, like, far in the distance. I didn't see it either. I did see the shadow of the camera. Yeah, on the guy. On the guy. The, it's on crossing the creek. Yeah, crossing the creek, the river, right. Yeah. But I didn't see a car. Yeah, I, I heard about it, 
And now I'm wondering if it's really there or if it's just a just a rumor. Yeah. So uh, if anyone knows which shot it is, let us know. I'm going to go to bed. All right. I'm going to go get a job as a stagecoach driver. So one day I can make enough money to marry my Mexican girl, Juliana. Andy, Amazon, uh, Amazon doth uh, doth deliver this week. <laughs> doth uh, it always? It, it doth it. It doth deliver. Uh, I've got pathetic chase from Ibunga Tembe in 2010 with a one star who says, "How are descendants of Native Americans feel about this movie? Indians, in quotes, are given no agency, no humanity. They make noise like animals and swarm like bees without any rationality. The chase adds insult to injury. As I watched the scene trying to get into the movie, I kept telling myself, why don't they just shoot the horses if they want to stop the stagecoach? Why depict Indians in such a dumb way as people without intelligence and common sense when they knew the land better than the Anglo immigrants? Other than that, I understand why people have long liked and cherished this movie. All right, a bonga. <laughs> I love that last line. Yeah. I'm surprised you're not laughing harder at that last line. I even delivered it funny. It was good. It wasn't good enough, Andy. I almost want to do it again. You start over. No, I'm not going to do it. No, okay. now I'm now I'm now I'm hurt. <laughs> Did I crush your your uh, soul? <laughs> No, I know what's happening. I know you that you probably weren't even paying attention. You're off there. No, I know what's happening. Uh, playing Minesweeper. Pouring blood from your head again. <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny part about uh, Ibongas is, uh, you know, you look at the comments and somebody actually said, they were called savages for a reason. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> like, wow. Really? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I've got a one star also by A. Niles, who uh, hated it, as he said, hated it. I hate all John Wayne stuff. I hate John Wayne, and I don't usually wish hate on anyone, but I wish he hadn't. (laughs) (laughs) That's it? And then he kind of leaves it there. (laughs) Just like, you know, he stopped mid-thought, like, there was going to be more, but... Oh, Niles. Yes, yes. Thanks, Amazon. Thanks again for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the episode. If you'd like to learn more about membership, head on over to thenextreel.com slash membership where you can see how you can support the show. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.